Hey, so uh, this video is actually specifically for my friends in Mr. Munza's class because we are reading uh, Magic Treehouse and so I'm doing Fact Tracker with them. So if you'd like to listen to the Fact Tracker, you can. I'm not really going to be showing the inside of it. Mr. Munza's friends have the book in front of them. Uh, so, I mean, I guess if you want to listen to it, you can, but it's kind of pointless. So, for Mr. Munz's friends who are going to be reading Fact Tracker with me, um, I'm going to split this into, like, uh, probably three segments. I think I'll do, like, I don't know. Is this split up the same way as the other books? Ten? Nine? Okay. There's nine, like, chapters, so I'm going to split it up into three groups. I'll do chapters one, two, three in this video, and then I'm going to upload a second one with four, five, six, and then seven, eight, nine, and that way, uh, in case you need to stop, you don't have to sit here and listen to me for, like, an entire hour. Okay? So, Mr. Munz's friends, we are in Fact Tracker, Mummies and Pyramids, and I'm going to read it. You can follow along in your book. Um, cause like I already said, I'm not going to be showing my book to, uh, anybody. I'm just looking at it. So I'm starting off on this very first page. This is Dear Readers. It says, Dear Readers, we came back from our adventure in Mummies in the Morning with lots of questions. Why did people make mummies? What was written in the Book of the Dead? How did ordinary people in ancient Egypt live? We didn't go back to ancient Egypt to find the answers. We didn't even leave Frog Creek. We were fact trackers. We started at the library. We found books about pyramids and mummies and a DVD about the Egyptian people. Then we checked the internet. We found a website that told us more about ancient Egyptian writing. We took lots of notes and Jack even drew a picture of a mummy's tomb. Later, we watched a television show about finding the tomb of a mummy called King Tut. In this book, we're going to share the facts with you. So get your notebook, get your backpack, and get ready to travel back 5,000 years to learn all about mummies and pyramids from Jack and Annie. So on to chapter 1, page 13, Ancient Egypt. For thousands of years, mummies and pyramids were a great mystery. How were the pyramids built? Why did people make mummies? What was the strange writing on mummy cases? In the last 200 years, scientists have learned a great deal about the people who built the pyramids and made mummies. They were a hardworking people who enjoyed life. They loved science and music. Page 14. They believed in a sun god and a cat goddess. They thought they could live forever. They were the people of ancient Egypt. So sometimes in the corner you can see Jack and Annie are telling us uh, some important vocabulary information. So right now Annie is telling us that a person who studies ancient Egypt is called an Egyptologist. And Jack is telling us that a civilization is a group of people with an advanced way of life that includes science, art, and most often writing. And now I will jump back in. Egypt is where one of the oldest civilizations in the world began. 5,000 years ago, Egypt Egyptians invented one of the first forms of writing. They made a kind of paper from reed plants. They invented a calendar much like the ones we use today. The ancient Egyptians built some of the most amazing buildings the world has ever known. Their painters and sculptors created beautiful works of art. Their doctors went to school to study how the body works. Why did such a great civilization begin in Egypt so long ago? Most historians think the answer is simple, the Nile River. The Nile River is the longest river in the world. It flows through the middle of Egypt. There's a little picture for you to look at that says Egypt is located in northeast Africa and the Nile River flows into the Mediterranean Sea. Next page. The Nile gave the ancient Egyptians water for drinking and bathing. Egyptian fishermen caught many kinds of fish in the Nile. Hunters hunted wild birds along its banks. Boats sailed up and down the Nile carrying people and goods. Page 18. But the Nile's greatest gift to the Egyptians wasn't fish or birds or drinking water or travel. It was mud. 
The next part is called Floods and Farming, and Annie tells us the Sahara is the biggest desert in the world. Most of the land in Egypt is part of the Sahara Desert. Desert soil is sandy and rocky. It is not good for farming. The ancient Egyptians called the desert the Red Land. No one lived in the Red Land. Hardly anything could grow there. The land along the banks of the Nile was very different from the Red Land. The soil there was dark and soft. The Egyptians called this land the Black Land. The Black Land was some of the best farmland in the world. Why was the Black Land so good for farming? Every July, the Nile flooded its banks. The flood water dumped a layer of black mud along each side of the river. The black mud was very fertile. That means it was full of the things that plants need to grow. In November, the flood waters went down. Farmers plowed the black land. They planted seeds in the rich, fertile soil. In March, they harvested their crops. The harvest was almost always very plentiful. That means there was more than enough food for everyone. And Jack tells us that to harvest means to gather and store the crops you've grown. Next page, 21 is called Two Kingdoms. Right above that, it tells us about the farming year, and it shows us um, the pictures on the other side. It says that July, there was the flooding of the water. November is when they did their planting, and in March is when they did their harvesting. So that's what the farm year looked like for the Egyptians. Two Kingdoms says villages formed near the good farmland along the Nile. Some of the villages became cities, over time, the villages and cities became part of two separate kingdoms. For many years, each kingdom had a different king. One king ruled over the land in the north, where the Nile flows into the sea. The other king ruled over the land in the south, along the Nile Valley. About 5,000 years ago, a king named Menes, Menes <laughs> united the two kingdoms. And he says to unite means to join together. Next page, King Menes built a capital city close to where the separate kingdoms had met. He wore a special crown. It was made from the crowns of both kingdoms. Page 23, most historians say the joining of the two kingdoms was the beginning of the great Egyptian nation. When King Menes put on his double crown, he started a civilization that lasted for 3,000 years. Turn the page to learn about the ancient Egyptian alphabet. So this is what we were talking about today, hieroglyphs. Page 24, hieroglyphic writing. The ancient Egyptians wrote with pictures. Their picture writing is called hieroglyphic writing. The pictures were mostly of things from everyday life, but the pictures did not always stand for the thing they showed most Egyptians never learned to read hieroglyphs. There were over 700 different signs. So that goes along with the story we were reading today because remember when they drew the picture of the cloth that kind of looked like a candy cane? So the pictures did not always stand for the things they showed. That's interesting. Next chapter, chapter 2, page 27, is called Everyday Life. Most ancient Egyptians were farmers. They lived in villages and towns in the black land along the Nile River. Their houses were made of mud bricks. The mud for the bricks was another gift of the Nile. Even wealthy people lived in houses that were very close to each other. That's because Egyptians wanted to save most of the black land for farming, so they didn't build their houses there. It was strictly for farmland. Egyptian houses usually had high, flat roofs. We're on page 28. Families often did their cooking on the roof. They sometimes slept on the roof in the summer. That's fun. Poor families' houses usually had only one room. Wealthy Egyptians had larger houses. They had servants to do their cooking, washing, and other chores. Annie says if you could peek beneath the roof of an Egyptian house, this is what you might see. So take a look at that picture. It looks like it's split up into little rooms. Page 29, most Egyptians did not have a lot of furniture. Their houses had only a few stools, small tables, and floor mats. Walls were painted bright colors. 
Ceilings were high to help keep the house cool. Egyptians slept on beds made of wood and reeds. They rested their heads on headrests. The headrests were usually carved from wood. If you look at on page 29, that picture of that bed, they didn't have pillows. They had headrests. That doesn't look to me like that would be very comfortable. Look like that will hurt my neck. Next page. Egypt has a very warm climate, which makes sense if they're sleeping on their roofs outside. Most ancient Egyptians hardly ever wore shoes. Their clothing was mostly white and loose fitting. Almost all their clothes were made of linen. Linen is a cloth made from flax plants. Ancient Egyptians cared a great deal about how they looked. Wealthy Egyptian men and women both wore eye makeup and wigs. They also wore necklaces, bracelets, and rings. Egyptians loved perfume. They liked to rub good-smelling oils and creams on their skin. That's interesting. Jack said on that last page, climate means the usual weather of a place. Children and family life. Egyptologists believe the ancient Egyptians loved children. Egyptian art often shows parents having fun with their sons and daughters. And Annie says at the bottom, yikes, young children in Egypt didn't wear any clothes at all. Ah. Next page, Egyptian children played with spinning tops and balls. Both boys and girls played with dolls and wooden animals. Children and grown-ups also played board games. These games were sort of like checkers or chess. Jack says that this is a tomb painting of an Egyptian queen playing a board game. Looks like chess. Page 33. Ooh la la. Look at those hairdos. Most children did not go to school. They lived with their parents until they were married. Ooh. Egyptian boys and girls wore their hair in a style called side locks. Nobody knows why. So boys and girls, it looks like they both shaved their entire head and then wore a side ponytail. Looks good. The ancient Egyptians were some of the first people to keep animals as pets. The Egyptians loved their pets. They treated them like members of the family. One, ooh, ee. One story says that when a family's pet cat died, the whole family shaved off their eyebrows to show their grief. Now, mind you, I don't have the best eyebrows, but I will not shave them off if my pet dies. Let it be known. Page 34. Artists and craftspeople. There were many skilled artists and craftspeople in Egypt. Sculptors and painters decorated the palaces and temples. Potters worked with clay to make bowls, jars, and statues. Weavers wove cloth for clothes and bedding. Shipbuilders built sailboats and barges for traveling up and down the Nile. Jack says a barge is a boat with a flat bottom. Other craftspeople made leather goods and jewelry. Page 35 just tells us again what those Egyptian craftspeople were. And Annie says Egyptian craftspeople were very skilled at their trades. They usually worked together in large workshops like this. A bunch of people working together. Page 36. Scribes. One of the most important jobs in ancient Egypt was that of a scribe. Jack says, scribes wrote on scrolls. These scrolls were made from a reed called papyrus. Scribes kept records for the government. They also kept records for merchants and traders. They copied down magic spells ooh, and scientific information. It took years of schooling to become a scribe, which was interesting because they just said on the last page that many children didn't go to school. So adults were becoming scribes. Uh, page 37, the hieroglyphic alphabet was very hard to learn. Most Egyptians never learned it at all. They hired scribes to read and write for them. Annie says, not fair. Only boys could go to school and become scribes. Hmm, interesting. Pharaohs. Jack says pharaoh means great house. 
The rulers of Egypt lived very differently from ordinary people. They had hundreds of servants. Their homes were grand palaces. Egyptian rulers came to be called pharaohs. Pharaohs had total power over their people. Ancient Egyptians believed their pharaoh controlled the weather. No, people can't control the weather. The flooding of the Nile and the growth of their crops. Egyptians thought their pharaoh was more than a person. They worshipped him as a god. Oh, cute. Next page. Jack and Annie present the animals of ancient Egypt. Crocodiles, hippos, and beautiful birds lived along the Nile River. Lions, wild bulls, and jackals also lived in ancient Egypt. Egyptian statues and jewelry were often made to look like animals. So it says this glass fish held perfume. This wooden goose sat on wooden eggs. This lion guarded a jar of face cream, and this hippo was a good luck charm. Those are cute. I like them. All right, chapter three, and then we're going to pause. Egyptian religion. Ancient Egyptians worshipped their pharaoh. They also worshipped many gods and goddesses. Egyptians pictured their gods and goddesses in several different ways. A few were like ordinary men and women. Some were like animals. Many were half human and half animal. The Egyptians believed the gods and goddesses watched over everything they did. Creepy. The bottom it says there's a picture over there of an Egyptian queen with falcon-headed god Horus. Falcon-headed god. Page 42, temples. The Egyptians built great temples for their most important gods and goddesses. Inside the temples were sacred statues. Priests at the temples cared for the statues. They washed and dressed them. They even served them meals. They couldn't eat them. They were just statues. Hmm, very interesting. Page 43. Ordinary people were not allowed to see the sacred statues inside the temples. When they visited, they said prayers and left gifts outside. At home, they prayed to their own statues of their favorite gods and goddesses. That's super interesting. The next life. An important part of Egyptian religion was belief in a next life. The next life was where people went after they died. There, they could enjoy many of the same things they had enjoyed on earth. Egyptians believed that every person was made up of three parts. The first part was the body. The second part was the ka. The ka was the person's life force. It was what made the person alive. Like a soul or a spirit? I don't know. Page 44, the third part was the ba. The ba was what made the person different from anyone else. Hmm. Egyptians believed that when a person died, the ba and ka left the body. For the person to live in the next life, the ba and ka had to come together again. Jack says Egyptians often showed the ba as a bird with a human head. Hmm. Page 45. The body was home for the ba and the ka, so it was very important that the body of a dead person not be destroyed. To keep the body from being destroyed, the ancient Egyptians turned it into a mummy. That makes sense. Turn the page to learn more about the gods and goddesses of ancient Egypt. Page 46. That picture looks almost like the boat hieroglyph from the story today. Remember, Jack was like explaining it as a hat. There was a bottom and then there were things that came up the top. That's kind of what that boat looks like, right? That's cool. Ancient Egyptians worshipped many gods and goddesses. Here are some of the most important ones. Page 47. Ra was the sun god. He was sometimes shown with the body of the man and the head of a falcon. So like that picture, a falcon is a bird. The Egyptians believed Ra created the world. They thought Ra sailed across the sky every day in a golden boat. At sunset, Ra sailed his boat into the underworld. We talked about underworld today, too. The underworld was a kingdom beneath the earth. At sunrise, Ra rose from the underworld and sailed his boat across the sky again. 
Ooh, page 48, 49. Osiris and Isis. Egyptians believed that long ago, Osiris and Isis had been the first king and queen of Egypt. When Osiris was murdered by his evil brother, Isis used magic powers to bring him back to life. Osiris became god of the dead and ruler of the underworld. Isis became the goddess of healing, marriage, and motherhood. Horus was the son of Isis and Osiris. He was a falcon-headed god. Egyptians believed their pharaoh was Horus in human form. Hmm. Page 51, Bastet. Bastet. Hmm. Bastet was Ra's daughter. She was a cat goddess. She was shown as a cat or a woman with a cat's head. Egyptians believed Bastet had the sun's power to make their crops grow. They prayed to Bastet for a good harvest every year. Bastet was also the goddess of music and dance and the goddess of joy and love. Oh my gosh. All right, one more page and then pause. All right, Tote. Tote was the moon god. Egyptians believed Tote gave them the gift of writing. He was also the god of medicine and mathematics. He was sometimes shown as a baboon. He was also shown as a man with the head of a bird. And apparently both of those pictures on the bottom, either one could be tote, even though they're two completely different animals. Page 53. He's cute. Bas was one of the Egyptians' favorite gods. He was short, chubby, and happy. He had a lion's ears and tail and the body and face of a man. Bas brought joy and good luck to families. He protected the whole household. Hmm. So I'm going to end this video because we've been reading for like over 22 minutes. And uh, that way you can take a break if you need to. And either later or on another day, you can come back and watch the next few chapters of the video. Okay? Keep reading. Love you.